and I was 14. And so I remember one night I was at a friend's house and I was like, hey, uh, I was hanging out. She goes, what are you doing here? You need to go home. And I go, uh, I don't have a home. And I had nowhere to go. And I remember that night I was sleeping on a park bench, man, and it was rough and I was scared. I didn't think Disney World existed. I thought it was a made up place because we couldn't afford it when we were younger. I think that was my first time to Disney World. It was amazing to be there. And I wanted to go back because we only went for like two days. And I fell in love. And I remember the first time I was there with my family, it was the greatest feeling in the world. For your company, when you start Result Roofing, what are some of the struggles that you face when you start this business? So I remember day one, man, I didn't know what to do. We didn't have an office, so I started my day at Chick-fil-A. I remember I was asking my son, Connor, I said, Connor, like, you know, what are we gonna do? And he loves going to work with me. He goes, Dad, let's just go to work. I'm like, you're complaining about work-life balance and the Sunday you had off work, you're watching football with your bros? I believe it's work-life integration. I tell my wife the good of the company and the brand and where we're going. I bring her into the vision about what it's gonna take, but I'm also saying, hey, we're gonna do these four trips a year. I might have to work seven days a week, but once a quarter, we're gonna go on a trip for three to seven days. I have a rule, you leave here, you're dead to me. You're never gonna be great at work if you're not great at home. You're never gonna be great at home if you're not great at work, right? You gotta, you gotta do both. And so that's just the philosophy I have. I don't look for balance. A lot of, when you're chasing greatness, you're gonna be unbalanced a lot of the time. Dustin, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, man, I appreciate it. Yeah, yeah. Um, I've heard a lot of your story. I look you up. You, you're doing a fantastic job, you know, and you, your story very inspiring. Thank you. I appreciate that, man. Yeah, yeah. So before we start, I just want to ask you, what's uh, three things you're you grateful for today? What am I grateful for? Another opportunity. So funny story. I have an alarm that goes off every day at 5 a.m. Uh, and it says grateful for another opportunity. Uh, every day is another opportunity to get up, chase your dreams, go after what you want, improve, grow, and you're here, man. So I'm very thankful for that every single day. It sounds kind of corny, but it keeps me grounded. That's awesome. That's awesome. So let me ask you this, because I, I, I know a little bit about you. And could you tell me like how, about your upbringing? How do you become end up homeless? and then transform yourself to a CEO multimillionaire company right now. Yeah, um, so the, the, the backstory is, you know, I was born into like, you know, trailer park, drug filled kind of family. Uh, I didn't know my real dad at all, uh, zero. Like, I don't know his name is, I've tried to find him. Uh, we have like, we literally have no idea like, even what his name is, right? So, um, you know, it was just an abuse filled home, drug filled home, just trauma filled, and it just wasn't the best environment. Right. And I, there's, you know, an event that happened one day and I just kind of had enough, man. And I said, I can't do this anymore. Right. And I left and I just, I really didn't know where I was going, but I knew I was leaving. And so I think part of the, the reason I ended up homeless was, you know, had I maybe gone out that day and maybe had a sleep. Uh, you know, on a park bench that day, I, who knows, I might have went home, but I was able to stay like at a couple friends house, like, you know, because you go to a friend's house and you're, you're hanging out and then it gets late. And you're like, hey, Mrs. Jones, can I just hang out here tonight? Yeah, not a problem, Dustin, because like it wasn't a big deal. We'll just go to school in the morning. And uh, but uh, if I had had I not had that, I might have, you know, probably went back home, which wouldn't have been good. But, um, you know, I, I kind of bounced around from, you know, I'd try to stay on a couch or, uh, you know, stay at a friend's house, but you, you wear out your welcome really quickly because it's school night and I was 14. And so I remember one night I was at a friend's house and I was like, hey, uh, I was hanging out. She goes, what are you doing here? You need to go home. And I go, uh, I don't have a home. And she's like, started laughing like, oh, OK, like, yeah, you do. You need to get out of here. It's a school night. Get home. It's getting late. And I had nowhere to go. And I remember that night I was sleeping on a park bench, man, and it was rough and I was scared. And uh, it like I was crying and it was cold, you know, it, it was just it was like, man, I'm, how did I get here? And I just really kind of like questioned. I had bad thoughts man. I had like suicidal thoughts. But at 14, you don't know what those really are. Mm -hmm. You don't know how to handle those. You like you start having like, man, why me? Like, hey, man, does, does God hate me? Like, what what is going on? Like, what did I do to deserve this? You know, and you fall into that victim trap. And I was just really scared, man. I was I was a kid. And, you know, I, that happened multiple times where I'd have to sleep on a park bench or like on a I would sleep on someone's back porch, like someone I knew because it just kind of made me feel a little more safe. And uh, luckily for me, when I was like 
I don't know, I kind of bounced around house to house and finally one family took me in for, you know, multiple months. And then I had one of my really good friends who's still a good friend today. Uh, his dad was like, you don't have anywhere to go, do you? And I was like, you know, what gave it away? Like, cause I didn't know, I didn't ever talk about it. I was embarrassed, mm. you know? And he was like, man, you're not going anywhere. So I was like 16 years old and he let me live with them. And so, I, I mean, I definitely wouldn't have graduated high school had it not been for that. Uh, I lived there for probably two, three years. And uh, until I got kind of my first job, moved out. So I, w I was very thankful for, you know, for, but it was about a, I don't know, man, a year, year and a half. I was, I was homeless. Like something, I, I, I would sleep literally anywhere I could. Right. And I was mm -hmm. trying to sell my way in until that moment. Uh, and so, you know, it was tough, but I think it made me who I was today. It kind of taught me a lot. And it goes back to, if it's, I think that's a perfect question, man. I didn't even think about this, but it really does tie in why I'm so like grateful for each day. Because I think there was a point in my life, man, where I didn't know if I was going to get another day. Like there was days I was scared that maybe my mom was going to get beat to death. Maybe I would, you know, how far would people take it that are drugs and alcohol? And so I think now it's just this, this man, I'm so grateful. Like, man, I got another day. Like I woke up. There's times in my life where I didn't think I'd wake up and I didn't want to wake up. And now it's, oh, man, this is life is great. Right. This is phenomenal. And it's your choice and it's your destiny. And it's it's. The, the simplest thing is like, look, your life is a book, and, but you mm -hmm. get to write it. And so, mm -hmm. yeah, man, there's times that it doesn't go your way, but you get to change the story at any point you want. And yeah. I'm just trying to rewrite my story. And so it's something that I can be proud of. Mm -hmm. Very, very good. Um, you sharing this because uh, I think what I was like, what went through your mind as 14 to 16 homeless Ben to Ben is like, you saw your friend have family. You don't have nothing. What went through your mind that time to keep you motivated every single day? Get up, get stuff done. Yeah, I think it was almost an escape, right? It was, yeah. you know, people are like, well, why'd you still go to school? Because that was probably the funnest thing in my life, right? Like I, I got to go interact with people and uh, early on in my life too. So we were dirt poor and, you know, yeah. people used to make fun of my shoes, my clothes mm -hmm. at a young age. And so I remember when I was in art class, like sixth grade or seventh grade, uh, they were, we were making those like clay pottery where you'd make like the birdhouse or whatever. Mm -hmm. And the, the teacher was like, Hey, today's a free day. What would you guys like to make? And we'll do it. And one of the kids was like, let's make Dustin some new shoes. Cause he's got holes, holes in them, <laughs> man. I was so mad. Um, I laughed at the time, but I literally asked to go to the bathroom later and cried my eyes out because I had hand-me-down shoes that had holes in them, right? It was the truth, mm -hmm. but it mm -hmm. hurt me bad because I was a child. I was in sixth, seventh grade. And so I think when I got like 14, 15 and got into high school, I was able to like make friends. I think me being in the situation I was in, it forced me to put myself out there a little bit. But I think, mm -hmm. you know, I... I, and unfortunately, I lied about a lot of my circumstances and I just mm -hmm. wanted to be accepted. And so I think going through my mind was just like, I just want to be accepted and I want to be around people. So that part of it was fun to me to be able to be around people that maybe you know, weren't on drugs, weren't doing those things. And so every I felt like everybody around me had a better life than where I came from. So I just wanted to be around it. And mm -hmm. so it motivated me to go to school. So I didn't really like school per se. I liked being around the environment of people that mm -hmm. were doing that so it forced me to go to school and it forced me to to really do those things yeah because um based before like for me back in the day because my mom sent me to us by myself and oh, 10 really? years old uh, in oregon so i had to fit in and i don't know anything yeah. i got bullied by um by the guardian kid son he bullied me so my escape was is my friend gladly all my friend is wonderful they help me. Yeah. And yeah, that's, uh, I can't relate to that. <laughs> yeah. Well, that you was know. the same thing, man. I remember, uh, I remember it was eighth grade. It was kind of like the first real fight I'd got in. And, you know, it was, I was eighth grade because eighth grade was like the cutoff to go to freshman year. And like, we used to fight like in our neighborhood and stuff with like the neighborhood kids. Cause we grew up mm -hmm. in a bad area, but I don't know. It was different. It was like the first real fight that I got in where I really felt like anger and these mm -hmm. kids are just making fun of me and there's three of them. I had enough. And like, I was yeah. like going to hurt someone and I'm not proud yeah. of it, but they were yeah. making fun of my shoes, making fun of my clothes. And we were in the hallway and there was no one around. And I just remember I just hit the dude as hard as I can. 
And yeah. it was just an escape because I was tired of getting bullied, right? Yeah. I was, yeah. was tired of it. You just got fed up with it and you mm -hmm. got to punch the bully in the mouth. And when I did, it was a funny thing. That kid never messed with me again. Um, yeah, <laughs> that's how it is. Never came of my shoes again. You know, like, <laughs> uh, but it was, it was, it was, it was like an escape. And so making those friends was like, I guess, escape from my reality. Yeah, that's wonderful. So you'd say that you don't have a strong father figures. When was you raising up? Now, who are you looking up to and why do you choose them to be your mentor? Um, so uh, in business, uh, I kind of had a life mentor, I would say, before uh, I had a father. I, I'm a huge Lakers fan. So yeah. I look at he's like my Phil Jackson, who I think is the greatest mm -hmm. coach ever. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, 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 I had some skills coming up through, let's say, career path. I started in sales at like 18, 19 years old. And, you mm -hmm. know, I broke company records. I had a lot of success. And I was always at the top, no matter which company I worked for. And that allowed me to get away with a lot of things. Because when you're a high producer, most people want you to just keep producing. And so they let you get away with anything. And mm -hmm. it was really, you know, I think it stunted my growth as a person because people allowed me to act a certain way. And if I didn't like something, I wanted it done a certain way and I would throw fits, be like, look at me, I'm the best, whatever. Mm -hmm. And so I met a guy um, when I, I worked at a, a place and he was my uh, like district manager and I was, you know, an up and coming kind of sales manager. And he just held me accountable and he told me things that I needed to hear, not what I want to hear. And I remember that I worked with them for, you know, two or three years and we created a, a, a really close bond. But I got just really frustrated with him always like coming down on me and stuff and uh, the, his boss. And so th I didn't ever leave the company because of him, but I thought it was time for me to leave and go go mm -hmm. on my own. And actually, like crazy story is is kind of like the Kobe, uh, Phil Jackson, where he left being his coach. And then he realized that that was what he needed. And so I spent years actually working with other leaders that didn't care about me like he did and they didn't hold me accountable. And I realized that people that hold you accountable and people tell you what you need to hear, not what you want to hear. And the people that challenge you are actually the people that care about you. And so I spent my whole life thinking that those people were your enemies and they weren't. And so actually we later on became business partners, right? And uh, because he was the guy that I feel like I wouldn't be here had I not had that kind of coaching. And he really helped me on life coaching and just he never coached me on work related things. It was always about my emotional intelligence and being mentally tough and how to overcome certain things. And I would say as a father and this this I would say the person that I chase as a father is myself. I'm always trying to mm -hmm. be a better version of myself. And the reason why is I didn't have a father figure. And I actually thought I was going to be a terrible dad. And I love being a father more than anything on earth. And so being a father is like my favorite thing to do. And so I'm constantly on this quest to just improve myself and to be a better dad and a better father. And opposed to looking up to someone on how they do it, I look at like, how would I want to be treated, right? Like if my mm -hmm. father was in my life and I had come from a great father figure, what would I want him to look like? How would I want him to act? How would I want him to be around me and do things with me, take me places? And I think of just all that. So for me, it's like, I want to improve myself. So I'm constantly always looking at my past self. Like, can I be a better father? Are my kids proud that I'm their dad? And so it's this, this quest to improve myself. And I really look at the things I do and say, how could I analyze mm -hmm. it as a better father? Am I there enough? Am I doing those things? And it's just really that past of, if my father was around, what kind of father would I want him to be? And I try to model to be that father. It's like, always be the leader you wish you had, right? And that's what kind of I do it as for mm -hmm. being a dad, a father. Mm -hmm. What kind of advice that your, um, your mentor uh, had stick you the most? Like one advice. Yeah, the the advice was um, really just all all boiled down to like mental toughness and the emotional reactions. Mm -hmm. So I just give examples like when something didn't go my way, I would throw a fit or, you know, complain. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and it would always he said, man, every time you throw a fit, you're starting over and you're basically just you're when you have this relationship with someone and you emotionally react that way, you're starting back over at zero. And he's like, people don't want to be around that. They might tolerate it, but they don't want to be around it. 
And he just walked me through how every time in my career that I did that, where did it leave me? And when I replayed my life as a bad upbringing, I always yeah. tried to blame that, right? Oh, well, mm -hmm. yeah. I, was, I was raised. But here's the crazy thing. My, my mom wasn't around during those times. My childhood wasn't there when I threw a fit. My mm -hmm. dad wasn't there when I threw a fit. And so the common denominator was me. And so I had to own it. And him walking me through that and explaining about just the emotional intelligence of it, it stuck with me forever. And it's still, I still jump offside sometimes, right? We still emotionally react. We're not perfect. Yeah. But I try to be cognitive of if I feel myself jumping off that because I've seen how my life's changed when I've learned mm -hmm. to channel my emotions into something positive. And so mm -hmm. I think we're all emotional and we're taught to not be emotional. We're taught that emotion doesn't belong in the workplace, yeah. but emotion does. Just the mm -hmm. right emotion. You can yeah. you can have emotions, but you don't have to be emotional. You don't have to emotionally react. And so really channeling them to be more productive instead of being a problem. Yeah, yeah. Because I, I can relate it to you with that because I have the, you know, anger issue that when it's come to like a lot of work come constantly and there's a pressure it's like you need to do this on time. And there's a pressure is turned I'll be kind of like I'm going angry. Yeah. However, now I learned that I need to regulate my emotion. So by doing that is for me is I do uh, I pray and I meditate. I don't know what you do to calm you down and then let's work it out. Yeah, uh, I I tell myself I, you know again I try not to get too highs with the highs and too lows with the lows. The good, the bad, the indifferent, the ugly, and I've just learned that. You don't have to get over things um, I, like I'm never going to get over my trauma. I'm never going to give over some of those demons. I laugh and I'm like, look, man, I got more issues than a magazine stand. Right. <laughs> but I know they're there. And I think the awareness of knowing it's there. It's like I had to have a realization with myself when our son was born to my wife that I was a loser. And my mm -hmm. wife, like, you're not a loser. No, I'm a loser. I'm mm -hmm. a loser. I was born a loser. I grew a bigger loser and I'm a loser right now. Mm -hmm. And I think just admitting that to yourself, it allows you to start to change. So like if you tell yourself, cause you'll hear people, I don't have an anger issue. You know, that guy pissed me off and it's like, okay, fair enough. But you still have an anger issue. Yeah. When you admit to yourself that you have this problem, I think it's that self-aware. And so for me, it's like, I'm the same way, man. I, I have anger issues at time. Yeah. I would say I'm highly, highly emotional and wildly competitive, which is a recipe for disaster. Yeah. And but understanding that's who I am and accepting it when something good comes to me and I want to get really excited or if something bad comes to me and I want to get really angry or if something comes at me sad and that makes me really emotional. My thing is, I feel like all three of those are the same feeling. Just they're going to make me feel slightly a different way. They're all the same type of feeling, though. Happiness, I use, like, for me, I'm scared of heights, right? So I'm not skydiving. But I have friends that are like, I love to skydive. I'm like, what's wrong with you? They get excited. If I get in there, I'm freaking out, right? So but so why do we do the same thing but have two different, you know, feelings towards it? So when those things hit me, I'm just like, okay, man, calm down, slow down, kind of let this initial pass, and then make a decision. And some people will be right there and like, Hey, man, I, I can't talk to you right now, right? Or give me a few minutes. Let me just get my thoughts. And then I won't do something or react until I get those thoughts. And so I've used it in stages of life. So when I was an emotional train wreck, some things would affect me for years. So yeah. I let my childhood affect me for years. Well, then I start to say this has hindered me for years. What if I could get this to only hinder me for a year? So I tried to look at things in a yearly basis, right? Mm -hmm. Well, then once I got it down to a year, I said, well, why can't I get this down to a month? When something happens to me, why don't I minimize my time that I'm angry or bitter or feel the victim? And then when you start getting really good, you get it down from months to weeks to days to hours to minutes. So now when something comes up at me, I, hey, man, it might make me pissed off for a split second, but I'm like, I cannot let this last more than a minute. Get it out of the way. Now let's move on. Now what? Here's the problem. Okay, Dustin, what's the solution? So I went from dwelling on things for years to now I'm like, you got a minute, let's go. And I think if you start to focus on that, you start to become conscious of it. And then you're able to kind of navigate yourself through those different feelings because you're aware of them. And when you're aware, it helps you kind of predict the future of what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. Wow. Mind blow. <laughs>
so those kind of stuff I need to do too as well. Like for me, I, I, I write it down. Yeah, I love that. I feel like I just write it down, whatever. And who gonna read? I'm the only one to read. Yeah. But it's really helped me to control my emotions. Like, oh, I, I have this feeling. I, I don't feel good. Because I, 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 I aware of when I'm angry, it's affect on the whole everybody around me, especially my wife can feel it. I, I get that. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and it doesn't, it doesn't go well as well. So I need to control that. And I think Something I need to learn. <laughs> yeah, no, and so it's fine. Like I think the, the you gotta you got, so many people don't they don't want to be self aware, right? Mm -hmm. It's harder to say you're these things, and we get offended. Like if if somebody walked up to me the street and said you're a loser, like, you know, I'd like you know you probably want to fight him, right? Like yeah, a reaction. But what if it's true? Like what have I really done in my life to say that I'm not? And so I mm -hmm. think owning that who you are and your mistakes it allows you to change, and then. You know, finding out what you can do to be better. Like, I need to read more books, right? Because the more mm -hmm. knowledge I have is power. So uh, I look at things that help me. So every day I wake up, I first I have that thankful for another day. And that mm -hmm. just helps me get my mind into a place. And then I'll watch the same video every day. Uh, it's by it's Kobe Bryant video. It's called Greatness Has a Cost. It's about four minutes and 30 seconds. And I mm -hmm. watch it every morning like a psychopath. But it helps me get in the right frame of mind because... It, it keeps me grounded in the cost that I'll have to pay if I want to be great, right? And the mm -hmm. people around me not being understanding. So I start my day that way at 5 a.m. And then I get up and I go cold plunge immediately, right? As soon as I get going, I go cold plunge. And I do the cold plunge for three to five minutes. And mm -hmm. people will ask me, oh, what are the benefits, health benefits? Have you done this? And I'm like, man, I don't, I don't care about your research. I care about how I feel, okay? So when I get, in that, when I get into that cold plunge, <laughs> I've done it for about eight months straight, right? Every morning, I do not want to get in it. I promise you there's not a day that I'm like, woohoo, I'm excited. Let me tell you, if somebody had a camera on there, they, it would probably be fun because I, I stick my finger in there. I'm like, oh, man. And I start talking to myself. Don't be in there. Get in there. Stop being like this. And I talk to myself. And then I, like, stick my toe. And I'm like, and I get in there and I stand for a minute. And I won't start my timer until I fully get in there. So then I stand there for, like, 30 seconds, even though my toes are numb. And I'm like, oh, my God, oh, my God. And then I finally do it and I get in there. And I stay in there. Typically, five minutes is kind of where I like to stay. But I can mm -hmm. feel all this pain. I feel like all the good, all the bad, all the demons leave my body. I feel like yeah. it gets everything that I'm feeling out, and I get to start zero. And mm -hmm. when I get out, I feel so much better. I feel energized. I feel clear. I feel good because you have to work on your breathing to get in there. And so yes. it, it allows you to get to a place. And then as soon as we get mm -hmm. out... I have friends in, that come over and there's eight to 12 of us and we do a workout for about 30 to 45 minutes in the garage. We get a high intensity workout. We got full weights in there and it starts my day, man. So by, you know, 7 a.m. I've cold plunge. I've done all this kind of, I would say meditation. We've worked out. I'm with my brothers. And so while most people are still sleeping, my day's already been two, three hours of getting going. And so I feel better. I feel energized. I want to go mm -hmm. do stuff, but there's not a day that I get up that I want to do it. But what it's, what's helped me is now on days, because I feel like life always comes down to decisions, mm -hmm. the days that I know I have to do something that I don't want to do, now I get it done because that's my habit and that's my standard. Mm -hmm. And then the things that I know that I shouldn't do, that I know that I want to do, right, like eat bad foods, not work out, I don't make those decisions because I know what the consequences are. And so it's putting myself in that kind of uncomfortable position up front and doing them it also allows me to start my day better. So I'm not as angry. I'm not as frustrated, right? And yeah. the days I don't do it, I'm super angry, super frustrated. So I'm yeah. like, if I know that, why would I allow myself to do it, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because uh, I, I do the same. So basically in the morning, I have a personal trainer. That's awesome. Yeah. And I was like, dude, every single day, I feel so regret to come here. Yeah. But as soon as I feel done, I was like, I'm glad I did it. <laughs> You want to kill them when you're there, but then when you're done, you're like, oh, man, I needed this. Yeah, I needed this because somebody needs to cut, kick my ass because if I go to gym by myself, I caught this all myself. I was like, I'm being lazy. I'm not pushing myself. Somebody just be there for me. It was like, Mike, you need to do an extra pull, 50, 60. Absolutely. I was like, what? I wouldn't do that in a gym. I don't do 10. Yeah. So I was I'll like. i on my phone texting people and then leave. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's good, good. Now you mentioned a funny part that you're scared of height. Yeah. But why do you choose roofing business is height? <laughs> Listen, 
I never claim to be the smartest guy out there. I've only said I'll work hard. I never claim to be the smartest. Uh, I was deathly afraid of heights. And so the first roof I ever got on, I couldn't get on it. It's a true story. So I put the ladder against the gutters and I was shaking. I was so scared. Like yeah. deathly afraid. Like I was shaking yeah. and the ladder hit it. Yeah. And they were like, you okay? I was like, no. Uh, I couldn't get up there. And so the second one, I was like, all right, man, the same thing happened. And I just remember telling myself, like, do I care more about my family or my feelings? And yeah. I was like, man, I got to get up there. And I was like, just get over it. And so I'm still afraid, right? Like, I'm still afraid. But now I'm like, I'm not going to let my life fears stop me from wanting to accomplish what I want to yeah. do. It's, look, and there's sometimes I get up there and I just feel bad. I'm like, hey, man, I just need a moment to get down because I'm afraid of them. And I'll get up and climb big ones, steep ones, and do them all. And I'm just like, because I, I feel like that, like in life, that's what holds most people back is their fear. Because yes. it, it, your fear of failure, fear of judgment, it's the fear of what people are going to say about you, think about you. Mm -hmm. And if you didn't have that, you would do anything in the world. Like mm -hmm. you would, there's nothing that would slow you down. You're ready to go. But mm -hmm. yet that's what holds us back. And so I'm like, either I'm going to let this fear of heights beat me or I'm going to beat it. And so mm -hmm. I said, just get your ass up there. I was still scared. I was up there like, oh, my God, get me down. But it got a little bit easier each time, right? And it's like now it's like public speaking. I used to if, – if it was more than a group of two or three, I couldn't do it. Uh, we have 120 you know, to 150 employees, and, you know, I'm speaking in front of, you know, every meeting, 75 to 100 people. You got to speak in front of them all. Yeah. And I, I used to hate that. And now it's just part of me because I practice it, right? And – I was like, you know what? In order to be a leader, you have to learn to talk in front of people. It's okay to be scared. It's okay to be nervous. But you got to go out there and do it anyways. Because if you don't do it, the fear is only going to get worse and worse and worse. And then you're not going to do it. So, I, you know, I start doing it. And there's days that I get nervous. I start sweating. Uh, and then there's days it just flows, right? So it just depends. But it was, it was, it was kind of funny that my two kind of greatest fears were public speaking, which I have to do because of a large company. And Heights, and I own a roofing company. I'm like, man, what the hell is wrong with me? <laughs> yeah, so uh, what what you say is I like overcome your fear, right? So w long time ago, I would do skydiving. I was freaking scared before I go in there. Yeah. And I, I just feel like I want to do it. But it's like people give me 10 documents. It literally say in the red line. If you die, we're not responsible for it. Oh my god! <laughs> ten of them, ten document, everything fine print, and I was like, okay. And then when we go up there, and the guy's like, okay, are you ready? He said one, two, and he's go. He didn't say three. He said one, two, go. Because if you three, you go like this. Yeah, but one, two, and then go dive, and there's a wonderful one, the best feeling that I ever did. When you go yeah. up there. It's so quiet and peaceful. I was like, holy shit, I'm glad I do this shit because I feel so empowered to witness. But, and we were doing Hawaii. Now you can see the sea, yeah. land, and ocean, and waterfall and forest. And I was like, wow, it's amazing. So I'm glad. I've been to Hawaii three times, uh, all three times Oahu, but I love Hawaii. I want to go back. It was literally the most beautiful place I'd ever It is. Been. Uh, yeah. I want to take the family out there. That's that's what, yeah. we, what we said is yeah family, yeah. But um, yeah. but I think if if you if you want to get your fear up to the next level, go skydiving. <laughs> uh, the things I'm good. I'm just this is what I said. So we were in Hawaii. It's funny you said Hawaii. So we were on a company trip. This is the, I was like 22, 23, and we were out in Hawaii, and they took us out to a, uh, one of the like coral reefs. And you were snorkeling, but the yeah. water was like three feet deep. It was crazy. Yeah. So far out there, but it was like three yeah. feet deep. There's all these like little Nemo fish. I'm like, oh, this is yeah. cool, right? And it, you're just un you're not really underwater. Like you're there. So then they take us to like this cliff, and it goes it goes in, and they're like, well, we're gonna go snorkeling. I was like, wait, we're gonna do what? And they're like, we're gonna <laughs> snorkel. But and I'm like, well, what's down there? And they're like, well, there's only the good sharks. I'm like, what do you mean there's good sharks? Like he's like, well, they won't bother you. I'm like, did you ask them? <laughs> Besides, like, I no, man, I'm not doing that. And he's like, what? I go, listen, there's, there's two things I don't do. It's non-negotiable for me. It's I'm the, I don't go snorkeling. I'm, I'm sorry, scuba dive. I was snorkeling. Scuba I, was, diving. I don't go uh, snorkeling because I don't know what's down there. I ain't scuba diving with sharks. Let me tell you something. There's never been a shark attack on land, so I'm not, I don't go down there. And I don't skydive because if God wanted me to skydive, he gave me wings. And if he wanted me to go scuba dive, he gave me heels. And I don't have either. 
So I'm good. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm good. And it's just like a not, I'm, I'm just, you know, could one day I do it? Yeah, I, you know, I probably could. Uh, but I just, I don't know. But then I'll do stuff like people are, well, well, well you'll do that. I'm like, yeah, I know. But <laughs> it's, it's, it's weird, but I'm, I'm no, no dice. That's, that's awesome. So uh, for, for, for your company, when you start re result roofing, mm -hmm. what are some of the struggles that you face when you start this business? Oh, man. Um, the, the, the main struggles when you start and you go back to year one is, I would say the biggest takeaway for me is I'd always worked in companies, right? And I've always worked for someone. And you go into somewhere and I think you take for granted mm -hmm like how much that company really does for you, right? You take for granted yeah. the systems and processes, you take for granted yeah. the website, business cards, uniforms, and office. Yeah. You don't think about it. You just assume that they have that. So I remember day one, yeah. man, I didn't know what to do. We didn't have an office. So I started my day at Chick-fil-A. Uh, so I had my two-year-old son with me and mm -hmm. we, did, we couldn't afford daycare at the time. So my son had to go with me and we didn't have an office. So I didn't have a uniform. I didn't have an office and I'm sitting there at Chick-fil-A eating breakfast. So it's like eight in the morning. And I'm like, what do you do? Where do you go? I was really confused, right? Like, oh, I'm an entrepreneur. Like, let's get it. And I remember I was asking my son, Connor, I said, Connor, like, you know, what are we going to do? And he loved going to work with me. He goes, dad, let's just go to work. And it was the greatest advice I'd ever received. So I just went yeah. out there and started like, okay, I have nothing to my name. Let me just go knock doors and try to get on roofs. And that's what we did. Me and my two-year-old literally took a, his wagon, some toys, and we went and knocked doors from dusk till dawn. And, you know, I, I think what it taught me is people to ask you, where's your website? I don't have one. Why? Mm -hmm. I just started my company. I'm out here trying to feed my family. And look, some people, that encouraged them. They said, man, I want to support you. You know, other people were like, nah, that's super sketch. And they were right. I don't fault them for that. And I think like the struggles were you didn't have an office. We didn't get an office. We got this little bootleg office like three months in that was like subleased. It was so bad. And, mm -hmm. you know, we finally saved enough money to get a website. And it was under construction the whole time. And, uh, you know, we had like these uniforms. We got branded and, you know, business cards and stuff like that. But for the first like three months, we didn't have any of that stuff. And I think it was a struggle because you use those things as a crutch to perform. And mm -hmm. I couldn't allow myself to use those as a crutch. Otherwise, my family didn't eat. And so mm -hmm. that was a huge struggle. And then, like, where do you hire, right? Like, how do you get people? Like, I knew where we were going. Like, from day one, I said we were going to do the things we've done. But how do you convince other people to believe in your dream mm -hmm. and your vision? And you have mm -hmm. nothing to offer them. And yeah. so, you know whether you'd interview people and they would work somewhere else or they would quit or whatever, it, you know, it hurt because I knew what we were capable of and I knew we'd go. So that first year when someone left us, it really bothered me. And, you know, I, I think as people, you don't realize the emotions you feel because when you work for somebody else, you always like that company, the owners, like you blame them. But then when you get on the other side, you realize that that's not the case. Like I truly mm -hmm. do care about our people here and I want them to succeed. And I never wake up a day and want them to lose right mm -hmm. and so when someone left you know they tell you don't take it personal i'm like what do you mean don't take it personal this is my company that i started i do take it personal i take mm -hmm. it personal for everybody that works here and it was just a struggle of how do you grow it how do you keep someone tied to it how do you spend all your time doing this admin office stuff but then working on growing the company and sales and so there was just not enough time in the day and i remember multiple days like Mm -hmm. literally no sleep or an hour sleep because there was stuff I had to do all day and then do it at night. Like there was no sleep. And so I don't think people talk about that enough that man, people like anyone can be an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. No, you can't. It's tough. It's not easy. It's easy for some people, but it's not for everybody. Some people are meant to mm -hmm. be a number two, but that's okay because you can be the mm -hmm. best number two out there and actually be more valuable than some entrepreneurs, right? There are some people that are the fifth mm -hmm. guy at a company that make more money than entrepreneurs if you're looking on money terms. And so I don't this whole it's cool to be an entrepreneur. It's cool to be a CEO like, no, it's not, man. If you're in the streets grinding, you know, the 24 hours a day, that's not cool. That's not fun. You're missing your mm -hmm. family. You're broke. You're working all day for zero. You know, nobody tells you that part and you're hoping one day you're going to come out ahead because you believe so much in the vision. And, you know, I think that was a huge struggle. And then I would say probably about two years in, it was when do you switch off from being the hustler 
the the grinder, the dude doing all the work to becoming a CEO, to working through others and believing mm-hmm. in others and empowering others. That's a difficult trans transition because when you start the company, you care about it more than anyone else ever will. And but at some point in your career, you have to stop being the hustler, the day one guy that built it with his hands, and you have to start empowering people. Mm-hmm. You have to start being a CEO. And it's a real struggle a lot of people don't tell you about. And I struggled with that. And I'm still every day try to get through that. But that was probably Mm -hmm. the main struggles early on and kind of two years in for our company. Yeah. So uh, how do you think that when you knock door to door, of course, there's a lot of rejection. How can you able to handle that rejection? And as I do, let's keep going. (laughs) No, yeah, because your 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 day is determined and dictated by that, right? And it can change yeah. on the mood you're in. So if you're in a bad yeah. mood and you go door knock, you're going to affect the people you're talking to. And yeah. your mood's going to determine if you have success. And so it was, I didn't look at the no's. I just said, man, it's going to be closer to a yes. You know, every mm-hmm. no I get, I didn't take that personal. And you would get mm-hmm. cut Man, I remember one time, like, I knocked on a door, and the guy's like, what the fuck do you want, you stupid roofers? And, man, my two-year-old's with me, and I'm like, hey. And my son's like, Dad, why is he saying that to you? He's saying, you know, bad words. And I'm like, hey, man, this guy had a bad day. And I was like, have a great day, sir. You know, we'd go on, and people would scream at you, yell at you. And some people, it was funny because they'd open the door, I told you, roofers. And they see your kid, they're like, oh, sorry. And they're like, just get out of here. And But I never took it personal. I always knew, like, you know what? If you're providing value to somebody, then why am I upset they don't want to? I'm mm-hmm. going to provide value to a customer. I'm going to take care of that customer like no one else ever has. And so mm-hmm. I just I didn't worry about the no's. I just said, okay, if I get 15 no's, man, the next one's going to be a yes. Mm-hmm. And I'm going to focus on that person. Mm-hmm. And I'm going to focus on the success. And it was uh, the only reason you really worry about the rejection is you're afraid of what they think about you. And for me, it's like I just didn't care what they thought about me. It's like... Mm-hmm. I just wasn't the best person for them. That's on them. And, you know, I would go back. Like, I I had a rule that as long as you didn't tell me to fuck off, I was going back. And so Mm -hmm. I'd go to the same house like five times. And they were like, dude, I already told you no. And I'd be like, listen. You know, I'd say, Mike, listen, here. uh, I got your neighbors approved. Typically, insurance doesn't approve roofs, right? They were having a leak. I just want to check yours out. Look, you can go with whoever you want. But if you allow me to inspect your roof, I'm going to give you a, a documentation report that's going to outline everything for you, good or bad, right? Just like I did for them. And so I found another another home in the neighborhood that was fine. And so at least you understand, I only want to help. No, man, I'm good. Okay, great. Have a great day. If I was in that mm-hmm. neighborhood again, I'd go back. Hey, Mike. And they're like, dude, what do you want? And I go, I want to help you. And I want to make sure I take care of you. And sometimes it's like, man, just get on my roof. And they would appreciate it. Some people would be upset, right? Some people would finally tell you to F off. But for the most part, yeah. like, I genuinely did care. And I wanted to go help. And if I was helping the neighborhood, we'd put out, like, barbecue pits, waters, whatever we could to, like, you know, mm-hmm. do a little barbecue with burgers once we got there. But I would go back. And it's like, I wasn't worried about the rejection. I was worried about the, somebody I could help. I knew I could do the right thing for them. And I wanted to be the one that helped them. And so I just didn't focus on it. It was just out of mind. Yeah, because I, I want to share with my story that, you know, I, I do I have a company in Arizona. We do distribute the motor oil for car. So every is our first company. And then we just go every single shop, door to door to door, yeah. knocking, talking people. And guess what? One of the guy, I just give them the brochure. He just ripped my brochure, put it in the trash. Like, get the fuck out of my shop! And I was yeah. like, okay, you good? <laughs> you get and then, and then, and then, it's, it's. I feel sucks. I feel bad. But three weeks later, I come back. He smile. He forget about the thing that he told me, and then he's my client. Yeah. So now he's gonna see. And that's what. Like, hey. Yeah. 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 It, yeah. But, it, but some. But I try to empathize. I think a lot of us need to practice grace. Uh, yeah. Is somebody, he must have been going through something that day. And yes. I was like, hey, man. And then I think about it from my standards. So, like, right now, if I'm at home, let's just say it's 6 o'clock at night. It's not dark yet. And I'm at, I have three kids. And I have three small children, right? And we have a security mm-hmm. system. We have everything you can imagine. Cameras yeah. all over the house. But let's say it's 6 o'clock and we're eating dinner and the doorbell rings. Babe, you expecting someone? No. Are you? my guard immediately goes up 
who is at yeah. my front door, right? I have three mm -hmm. babies here that I would protect with my life. And so my yeah. immediate, my spidey senses go up. So when I go to that door, I obviously check. I look at the camera. Hey, how can I help you? Hey, we're doing, I'm not interested. It's not because I don't care about what they're selling. It's because my thought at that moment was protect my family. And it could sound extreme, but you remember if somebody's at home, they're a single mom or their husband's at work, or maybe the husband just had a bad day. Maybe he's trying to relax. <clears throat> maybe he's on a work call. Mm -hmm. I just try to have grace with that person was having a bad day. I don't take it personal and mm -hmm. I just want to move on. Right. And yeah. I don't want to clap back. I don't want to say something stupid. I'm like, that person is having a bad day. Cause I think about it similar to kind of like online trolls. When somebody says something negative to you, like just think about you're online and you're scrolling and you see someone mm -hmm. comment a photo, a picture, something positive, and your thought is to go make fun of them, bully them, say something negative, your life sucks and you don't yeah. have shit going on. And so mm -hmm. you're trying to project your shit on other people. And so when somebody does it to me, I'm like, hey, bro, you need a hug. Are you good? And so, they'll, they'll, man, it's great. Like, they'll try to attack my kids. Like, I've had multiple times. So the other day, I post something about my kids, and this guy, I have no idea who he is, right? And he says, your kid looks like he's a retarded kid. And I go, I go, hey, man, well, you know, he gets that from me. And he's like, yeah, he's special needs. And I'm like, apple doesn't fall, fall far from the tree. Like, I, I don't know what to tell you. And he's like, he messages me and starts going like, you must, like, he's like so mad. I'm yeah. like, hey man, what are you yeah. mad about? I don't know yeah. you. You're calling my son special needs and I'm like brushing you off. I'm not going to clap yeah. back. And now you're angry that I'm not arguing with you. Hey man, do you need something? Are you okay? Are you going through something? And the guy starts, you don't care about me, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, I don't know you, but if you need to talk. And this guy went from angry to deleting the comment, apologizing to me, just saying he was going through some stuff. And it's so... It's like, I just don't get caught up in that crap, dude. Like, now, if yeah. you personally know me and you're saying something, I'm like, hey, man, what's going on? Like, what is this? Yeah. But some random stranger, I'm like, hey, man, I'm, I'm not worried about that. Yeah, I know. So, <laughs> same thing. Because I, I, uh, I, I receive a lot of comments like that on my YouTube, right? Yeah. And literally, one, I just responded to the same thing. Did you subscribe to my channel yet? <laughs> exactly. Please like and That's subscribe. It. Just like and subscribe. That's it. You don't need to argue with them because they, because they want to get your attention. Exactly. Now, if they get your full attention, now you you lo losing time. You're right? losing exactly. Yeah. So I I don't I don't fight. I don't. I'm just like, hey man, whatever. Good luck to you guys. Yeah, yeah. Let me tell you one of the story is funny, right? I I have to do my roofing on my house, right? I call one of the guy roofing company, and I was like, okay. Everything's done. Okay, 5,000. Okay. Okay, let me think about it. And then I called the other guy coming to and said, Okay, I can do everything for you. 2,000. Okay, let me think about it. And then I called my handyman who's taking care of my Airbnb, uh, my properties. Yeah. And then he come to my and said, How much you, you, can you do this with my roof? And he's like, 600. I was Sounds like, like Whoa. Real. And I was like, whoa, okay, then do doing that because, you know, my roof is like, I don't want to get leaked. I saw like the black thing on my patio is black. The wood is become soft. So I was like, you need to fix because it's raining. Uh, raining season is coming. Yeah, exactly. So uh, that's what I'm saying. So how can your company keep integrity, like not keep, you don't rip off the customer, you know? Yeah. So where are you located? I located in California. That's right. You're in California. I was just out yeah. in LA last week. I thought I, I knew it was Cali or Florida, uh, one of the coasts. Uh, so it's it's tough, man. So we we try to put integrity over everything. It's mm -hmm. impact over income, and we believe that with our employees. We believe that with our customers. And you know, sometimes a roofer might see something different, right? So yeah, obviously it's kind of like fixing your car. You go in there or a doctor, they might think this is wrong, might think that's wrong. So I always say like, even when customers with us, so we've had customers come to us and say, hey, they're, they're $10,000 less than you. And then there's somebody $10,000 more than you. And I'm mm -hmm. like, compare apples to apples. Always get mm -hmm. a scope of work, right? Yeah. Because what if they were, what if the one guy was just replacing the top and fixing it but what if one guy was replacing the wood right mm -hmm. so that's where the difference could have been like he could have one guy just says well i'm just going to seal the leak but i'm not going to replace the the damaged yeah. decking 
The other guy could have been doing it. So it's always, I say, look, compare apples to apples. Get get specific on what they're going to do because then we can compare scopes and say, well, mm-hmm. yeah, this guy was $10,000 less because he's not doing this, he's not doing that, he's not doing this. Well, this guy's 10000 more because he's doing this, he's doing that, and that's happened. And so I try to com- I even try to guide homeowners. Look, it's your home. You need to go with who you feel comfortable with because mm-hmm. this is construction. There's going to be things come up. There's going to be things yeah. that could go wrong, and mm-hmm. you're going to want to – uh, work with somebody you can communicate with and feel comfortable mm-hmm. with. So over mm-hmm. everything, find someone you feel comfortable with because if you go cheapest price, most expensive, none of that matters if you can't trust mm-hmm. the person, right? Yeah, exactly. So I try to guide them, but I think f- for us, man, is we're playing this legacy play, and so we mm-hmm. want people to feel comfortable with us. You know, we've been in business four years. We have you know eight hundred and seventy plus Google reviews. It's a five star rating. And we want to we want to make sure we maintain that we're proud of that, right? Mm-hmm. This industry in Texas, it's not regulated. There's no license, and so mm-hmm. it's the wild, wild west. And so roofers can literally do what they want, and we don't want to operate that way. We want to operate yeah. with integrity with everything we do, from our realtors, you know, our insurance partnerships. We we do insurance program work where we work with carriers directly. Uh, we work with a lot of huge, big time, amazing realtors here in DFW, and the reason why is because they can trust us. Because not all roofs need to be replaced and not all need to be repaired. So I know that if you send me three roofs as a realtor and I go back to you and say, listen, this roof is fine. There's some wear and tear. It probably needs to be replaced in five, ten years of you know storm, but it's good mm-hmm. to go. You don't need to replace mm-hmm. it. But if I tell you, hey, I just want to be clear with you, if you buy this home, it has some integrity issues, it's probably going to leak. You could get away with not replacing it, but I want to be honest with you. So I think we just provide a a, a bigger picture. We give options and we tell you the story. We're going to give you our opinion, but we're going to have a story document so then you as a customer can make the best decision. And so mm-hmm. we tried to just keep it that way. We really look at it like if it was my home, how would I want to be treated? So we treat our customers that way and everybody believes in that culture. Everybody operates that way. And if they don't, they get they get weaved out pretty quick. And so it's helped us just create this integrity like we know we're going to make mistakes and if we do we're going to own it and we're going to go fix it and we're not going to stop until it's done right and Mm -hmm. that's we've been our main thing and it all starts with look we're relational we're not transactional we don't just want to be a transaction to you we want to have a relationship with you so it's a feel-good experience Mm -hmm. well very good point we're relatable not transactional yeah i can tell you this though um you have very um strong branding Thank you. Very strong friend of your company. And you have, even you have a music video. Yeah, we probably have. <laughs> Fresh Roof of Bel Air. I yeah. love Bel Air. <laughs> yeah, we've done a couple. And uh, I don't see a lot of um, roofing company do that. Yeah. How do you do it? Um, I have a wild imagination. Um, mm-hmm. I'm very, like, I-, I love to create. And, you know, people say, well, it's easy for you because you you're, you know, a visionary. Yeah. And I'm like, no, dude, it's not. I've had to work on it. It takes a lot of effort and energy. But I'm like, roofing is not sexy at all. Like, there's it never is. been a Saturday where me and my wife are like, hey, babe, let's wake up and go roof shopping. It's terrible. <laughs> like, I don't want to do it. And I own a roofing company. So, like, I just wanted to make it sexy, make it fun, make it appealing and go, you know what, man, if, if I could, if I have to get my roof done. It's obviously not going to be fun. It's obviously mm-hmm. not an expense I'm, I want to pay for. And it's not something I really want to do. And yeah. usually when it does happen, it's because there's a storm damage, you know, high winds, hell, whatever it is. It's probably, you know, you hate to say tragedy, but it is. And you don't want to deal with it. Why not make it as fun as it can be? And so mm-hmm. it's this create these commercials, these videos, funny posts to have some fun. I mean, it's like we did Ice Ice Baby. We did it was Results Roofing Baby. We did the Fresh yeah. Prince of Bel-Air. Yeah. Uh, we did Easy e um, We actually have a couple more in the works that we're working on. Um, we do skits, and it's just to try to be funny. Uh, it's yeah. to try to... I feel like you can't educate people until you can entertain them, and I yeah. want to entertain them to bring eyes to say, like, we, we understand roofing sucks, right? We understand it's not something <laughs> we want to do. But yeah. like, let's at least have some fun if we have to do it, right? And it doesn't appeal to everybody, but it's who we are. Like, we want to have fun in what we do, and I believe you can. And so we just take a lot of pride in having fun and kind of just bringing something different to the audience. Yeah, so I think you, I think for, for you, you build something fun, and then now you can translate to your team. 
And now I can tell you one thing that you have built very such a strong community. You have a badass team. Thank you. Very badass team. And one of the quote that you on post on Instagram that you're saying this, I truly believe that I work for everyone at LR. Yeah. That they don't work for me. How do you build a great team that set up the high standards? Um, because I'm thankful for everybody that chose mm -hmm. to work here because there's 5,000 plus roofing companies in DFW alone. And mm -hmm. you had the opportunity to work at any one of them and you chose here. And yeah. I'm grateful for that. And I do mm -hmm. believe that I work for them. They don't work for me because they could go work anywhere in the world. Right. And I just think that you can have an environment that you work and have fun. Right. Yeah. You can do it the right way and have fun, you know, and make money. And so you can do it the right way and have fun and make money and take care of your customers. Always look at it as and, and not and or. And mm -hmm. it starts with you. If you don't believe in your standard and you don't have a standard, um, no one else is gonna follow and you just become a hypocrite, right? If you're out getting hammered drunk every night, but you tell your team not to, you're a hypocrite and there's gonna be no culture and people are gonna call you out on it. And, yeah. you know, there's a lot, I, I, I feel like, I'm authentic in my life. Uh, I struggled with being authentic my entire life because of my past. I didn't want people to know and uncover. And even like talking to you or talking to someone on a podcast, it's not easy to talk about my past, right? It still brings yeah. up trauma, but I do it because I hope it helps somebody out there. And that's why yeah. I do it. Um, and, you know, I believe in three things that you should care about here when you're at Results Roofing. And the first one is each other. You should care about each other. You should mm -hmm. care about growth and getting better and care about winning, right? And mm -hmm. Uh, look, I know I push people hard. I know that I demand, um, and I know that I'm going to, you know, try to get you out of your comfort zone. Uh, I'm going to, you know, require you to grow. I'm going to require you to get uncomfortable and I'm going to try to push you to be the best you can, uh, professionally, but more importantly, personally. And I want you mm -hmm. to grow into the person you're supposed to be. And so some people can't handle that. And I do push people too far. And Sometimes people get frustrated with it. It might cause them to quit or get frustrated with me and, you know, say things, but that's who I am. And mm -hmm. uh, only because I want to see you accomplish all your goals and dreams, because I know the power of somebody believing in you, what it can do for you. I know what it did for me. And so if I can be that person for you, I'm all about it. And I would literally rather you hate me and be great than be your friend and watch you fail. And I won't tolerate mm -hmm. it. And I don't want to be around average. And so you know, look, it's not for everyone, but the ones that are here, they want to elevate their game. Now, I'm not asking everyone to be at my intensity. Mm -hmm. I'm not asking anyone to work the hours I work. I'm not asking anyone to do what I do. But if I don't model it, then I definitely can't require anyone to do anything, right? And so mm -hmm. I think it's that standard and it, what what do you stand for and what is it that you'll accept? What does it require? And then what are you willing to do? You're asking people to do stuff that you don't do? Like, no, nah, man, like I'm all in here. This is my life. I love RR. I love the people I work with. I care about them. I enjoy being mm -hmm. around them. And so it's, it's just, I created a culture that I always wish I had, right? And mm -hmm. so, and I just live it and it's who I am. And so I don't try to be something I'm not. And you know, if you're not, I just look at it like this. Look, if, if most of the people that hate it, they've never accomplished anything in their life. They yeah. didn't win at anything. Yeah. And so they're going to question the way I do it. But I'm like, what have you done with your life? Zero. Exactly. Have you won anything? Yeah. No, you haven't. Yeah. So what are you questioning? Go win something and then question me and I might listen. And so typically the losers don't like it, right? It's like Nick Saban mm -hmm. says, high achievers yeah. don't like mediocre people. Mediocre people yeah. don't like high achievers. So average yeah. people are probably going to hate me, right? But mm -hmm. guess what? They're probably going to be average for the rest of their life. So it'll probably work out better for both of us if they're not here. Mm -hmm. But I can mm -hmm. tell you this team we have here is the best team I've ever been a part of. I love them top to bottom. They're incredible. They work hard. They care. You know what? Yes, they make mistakes, but we're looking to coach them up. Uh, we're looking to be better because I'm not perfect. We're not perfect. But collectively, we can do perfect things. And that's all we're looking to strive for is to be the best versions of ourselves we can be. Yeah. Yeah. So this is, is really, I, I one of the quotes from Patrick Bed David that he told me, like, once uh, you're going to hate me. You can, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to be tough on you, but once you leave my company, you can love me because it's like, I set up the high standards for you. 
Yep. And I, I, I don't bushing around like I just tell you straight up. You know, man, I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you what you need to hear, not what you want to hear. And I'm, look, yeah. I'm gonna talk bad to your face and good behind your back. Uh, when you leave a room, I'm gonna build you up, right? Uh, I don't mm-hmm. want to talk about you to other people in that regard. Uh, but I, but I am going to say it to your face and it's, we yeah. see it, man. What the craziest thing is there's this cycle of people that leave and they get so angry when they leave. Right? Like, yes, it's crazy. Cause they'll quit. And I'm like, Hey, wait a minute. Why are you angry at the company? You quit. You didn't get fired. Yeah. You quit for another opportunity. And they're yeah. so angry for about a month. And then it's, they go through this cycle of, Oh, they start reaching back out. Like, oh, you know, they almost like want to bend the relationship. And I have a rule. You leave here, you're dead to me, right? You're yeah. done. I don't want mm-hmm. you back. You gave up. Mm-hmm. That's it, bro. Good luck. And then they want to be like friends again. I'm like, I don't want to be your friend, right? And yeah. they, they have this cycle of regret, and then they get back to anger and almost hatred. Like, I can't believe yeah. you would do this. And I'm like, what are you so mad about? Oh, because you went out there and hung out with a bunch of people that didn't care about you and your family. You hung out with people that don't care if you lose. You're hanging out with people that don't push you, that don't require more from you, right? Mm-hmm. And and demanding you be the best you can be. And so you mm-hmm. realize that, wow, maybe I was an asshole. Maybe I was a tyrant. Maybe I was all these things. But you know what? I was pushing you to be the best version of yourself. And so now that you don't have that, you realize you're not motivated on your own. You're probably not going to accomplish much. And I see all these people that have left our company and they're not doing anything and they're worse mm-hmm. off. And somehow I'm like, I'm the blame for it. And I'm like... But you quit. And I'm like, but yeah. you, you, you know, when you leave the company, I want you better off. But most of them don't because they yeah. can't do it on their own. Right. Yeah. But I yeah. think they are better off because they know what they should do. They just can't mm-hmm. do it. So it's it's weird, man. You know, it, it's a it's a strange thing. Uh, I would say that we have a lot of people inside the organization that watching them grow from where they were to where they are now. It's been the, the best thing for me to watch because you're watching people that weren't leaders become leaders and creating mm-hmm. future leaders and inspiring others. It's mm-hmm. one of the best feelings in the world and watching people win alongside you. And so we've been able to have that been blessed enough to be a part of it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think it's transformation because, you know, um, I, I used to work as an engineer or a petroleum engineer in, in Texas. Oh, wow. In well, Dallas, in Dallas, um, Dallas. Yeah, I okay. based there and in Dallas, but I live in Grand Perry, you know, Grand okay. Perry. Yeah. Yeah. Grand Perry. And then we also um, we also always go drilling in Den- Denton. OK. Yeah. Denton. Yeah. And then Texas. Odessa and then I try to drive to Odessa. So it's like that. But the company, I, I, I love my job. But at 2016, when the oil price dropped, they laid me off. Yeah. I'm the first one laid off. And and the thing is, like, the funny fact is, like, when they lay, like, the, as soon the guy told me that I got laid off, he was like, give me your laptop, give me your car, give me everything, and somebody will drive you to your home. Like this. Yeah. I was like, dude, am I, I'm not angry or anything. It was like, why treat me like criminal? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Because typically they're criminals, right? People, yeah. people treat you like the way they are that's why i'm like don't take it personal like yeah. people will treat you as good as they are so if they treat mm-hmm. you bad it's because that's as good as they are and mm-hmm. you know it's like hey man uh if i don't get caught up in it because the way someone treats me says everything about them nothing about me and it, mm-hmm. so he probably he he's untrustworthy that's why he didn't trust you right if you never yeah. did anything to break that trust then mm-hmm. why not trust them but that's just unfortunately how people are man that's, yeah, that's how they are yeah. and they treat him for as good as they are. And he's probably, you know, not a good person why he laid you off so quick. And so he's used to people reacting a certain way because he's not doing it the right way. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So speaking of how do you uh, meet Kevin Holland? (laughs) Oh, Kevin Holland. Yeah. Yeah. So we have a podcast. We're both from DFW. So we're both from the Dallas area. Nice. Uh, Really good friends with his manager for a long time, knowing him and, uh, just connected over the last, you know, three, four, five years and uh, started doing stuff together as we, we both come up and we filmed some of his content for him and then started a podcast together and just, you know, became really good friends, became bros, became family. And, uh, you know, it's just I, I love watching him win. I love he's such a good person. He's a good guy. Uh, he's great at what he does. And so, just you know, it's been a, kind of on a journey together, right, to mm-hmm. continue to grow, be better and, and do this thing and 
whether it be podcast business and opportunities that come up. So just through our networks, we got connected and we just became really, really close. And he is an incredible person. So it's definitely fun, like the roofer bro and the UFC bro, right? It's probably not the normal yeah. combination, but it's fun. Yeah. Yeah. What pushed you to start a real I recognize podcast? Uh, one day we were at lunch and we just wanted to create a platform. We were talking about like realize, recognize. And uh, Kevin came up with the name like realize, recognize. And we're like, realize, recognize real talent. Right. And no matter what it was, mm. whether you're a real estate agent, an actor, a, you know, UFC fighter, it, it didn't matter. Like, let's have real talent on. Let's have talented individuals from all aspects of life. And so, you know, just want to get on there and talk about it, what they're doing and try to just, you know, ask funny stuff, flow with it. Um, have some fun, just really a conversation. And we were, we did it at lunch and then we just started filming and you know, it, it, it was, it was crazy. And then at the time Kevin was just retiring and then he came out of retirement. So it's just, it was, it was just fun, man. It just started off as to have fun yeah. and then took off having fun and we enjoyed doing it. He's got a big fight coming up. Uh, he's fighting in Miami yeah. March 9th and uh, it's a huge fight mm -hmm. for him. And I know he's going to go there, take care of business, but uh, I'm excited to get out there and watch it. That's awesome. That's awesome. We have a great connection. You know, like the podcast and also your company have the RR as as, as the same yeah. thing. It's like you see, strong branding right there. <laughs> RR and everything, right? I, I try to keep RR and everything we do. Uh, it's a part of who I am, and I, I love it. And so yeah. I try to I try to keep it RR and everything we do. Mm -hmm. So uh, let me tell you, uh, uh, who is the first person that teach you about love? First person, my wife. My my wife was the first person to teach me about love, hands down. I didn't understand love until my wife um, from anyone, right? I didn't because it's my family upbringing. I just didn't really feel loved um, mm -hmm. like that. So my wife was the first one to teach me about love and what we do. I watched her go through a pregnancy and give the birth of our child, emergency C-section. Um, I watched her believe in me even when I didn't believe in myself and, you know, uh, stay with me. So it was hands down, just, I never felt, I, it was crazy, man. I felt love, like this extreme love when I saw her holding our son, because mm -hmm. I just watched her being a, a mother was the most beautiful thing I'd ever seen in my life. Mm -hmm. And so it just taught me so much and opened me up to a whole nother world that I'd never felt without her. So it just 100% easy, easy is that it was her. Mm -hmm. How long have you been married? Um, so we've been together 10 years, but we've been together, it'll be seven years. Seven years. Seven or eight what years. Is, crazy. What a secret sauce. Yeah, crazy. Seven, seven years, man. I'm like, I don't know how the hell she put up with me for so long. But <laughs> 10 years, we just celebrated our 10-year dating anniversary. Um, she's my best friend. Uh, we have fun. We try to make time for each other. We get along. We talk through the good. We talk through the bad. Um, I just, it's, I think it's communication. It's just... We take it one day at a time, but you yeah. know, uh, we just we do a lot together, and it's just we're we're you know we're compatible. Love her more than anything in the world. Love her as mother, and you know we uh, I think it's just do things. I think people like they don't date their significant others. You know that like we just yeah. got back from a ten year trip in L.A. It just went yeah. her and I, yeah. and we just hung out, and it's just good to do that. It's good to go have a date night. It's good to hang out with your wife on the couch, right? Yeah. Uh, and when you have a problem, address it. Right. Don't yeah. let it stew. Don't let it fester. Mm -hmm. So we talk through a lot of those things. And sometimes if we don't talk. It's yell at each other. But hey, it feels pretty <laughs> good to get it out. Right. So yeah. and and we just have fun, man. We try to keep it fun. It's like we we make fun of each other. We talk crap to each other. We joke with each other. It's have fun. Like, why stop it? When you're dating someone, all that stuff's acceptable. And then when you get married, you're not supposed to do it. Like, no, man, we have fun. My wife razzes me. I razz her. We have other group chats. We have we have fun together. She's my best friend, and so mm -hmm. it's it's just it's it's great. It's to me, it's not like this marriage. It's like I'm with my best friend, and we enjoy doing things together. We enjoy going places together, and there's nowhere else I'd rather be than with my family. So it's pretty easy for me. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I'm doing the same things. Like uh, me and my wife been together for seven years. We do have a good fight. Thank you so much. But, and you know, every time that she cooking something for me, I always thank you her as a yeah. gratitude. I always have to pay attention to those. You, when you, you, you forget about it, but you have to remind yourself, like, like somebody saying this, like, um, 
When you treat something in the beginning, it never will be there will be an end. A hundred percent, right? Yeah. It will end and if look, I firmly believe if you don't take care of your wife, somebody else will. Yeah. And you better be careful because if you don't, someone like, oh, well death do us part. Yeah, man, but you're supposed to hold up your end of the bargain. You're yeah. supposed to like be say a good husband, say a good father, right? Like I don't know, it sounds weird, but I'm like so if I just get completely fat and out of shape and stop caring about life and lose everything that the reasons my wife met me, she's supposed to stay with me. I don't feel like that's fair. Mm -hmm. Why should she have to? And if you don't appreciate her and, you know, she doesn't appreciate you, but I know my wife appreciates me just like I appreciate her. And so I try to be better for her and I don't always get it right and I make mistakes and same, but mm -hmm. we try to be better for each other. And so I firmly believe that like if I don't treat my wife well, somebody else will. And i I'm thankful for her because she's such a phenomenal mother, right? And like, well, I wouldn't be here without having a phenomenal mother at home raising our children. And so I want to spoil her. I want to take care of her. I want her to have nice things. I want her to go places. I want her to be able to do things that nobody else can. I, it, it brings me joy to know that I can spoil my wife, like spoil our kids. It's like, I want to be able to do those things and take care of her, make her feel like she's loved and she's appreciated, right? And so, you know, it's not always about things, but it's 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 part of it. And I think if you care about somebody, love someone, why would you not want to spoil them? Why would you not want to give them a life that they dreamed of and help accomplish their goals and dreams as well and do it together? Yeah. So I, I do strive every day to make sure that she's living the life she's always dreamed of, make sure she lives the life she deserves. I can spoil her with gifts, places, anything like that, and just show her that I appreciate her, you know, when I can. Yeah. And what is the common thing that usually one of the same topic that you guys same have an argue about I'll argue lot. where we want to eat because <laughs> where we want to eat because they'll say babe what do you want for dinner and i go man i don't know babe whatever you want and she's like well, i don't care you pick okay let's get sushi eh, i'm not really feeling sushi okay well, what do you want i don't care you pick okay well, what about let's get tacos eh. I don't want tacos. I'm like, okay, so what do you want? I don't care. You pick. I told you. And I'm like, I picked two. I'm like, you know what? I'm out. And so at least I'm like, just fucking pick. And at least yeah. it's a fight. And so, you know, and I'll even Google. They don't have, I don't care. See, look, it's on Uber Eats. It doesn't, there's not there. And that's the greatest thing. We, like literally that's the greatest thing we fight about is where to, where to eat and, uh, or my kids doing something. Like my kids, especially because I have two boys and a girl, so my two oldest are boys, and they're spitting image of me. Poor things are doomed, and they antagonize my wife. And so I usually get in a fight with her over my kids doing shit, like them acting like badass little kids, get me in trouble because she's like, "You're just like your father," and I'm like, "Dude, chill out, bro. Like you're bringing too much heat on me, man. You gotta relax." <laughs> it's our two fights man is where we're gonna eat and my kids acting just like me which i can't yeah. argue that because they do poor guys <laughs> usually when when we have argue uh, argue about what to eat right i do the opposite side do you want sushi or you want mcdonald yeah <laughs> well, we only eat three like we have we eat sushi is our favorite thing it's our go-to we love sushi and it's like i'm like babe we eat sushi uh, Mexican or steak, like that's all we like. We don't, and, and typically it's sushi or Mexican, like. And so I'm like, just pick which one you want. It's not that hard. Yeah. Well, no, I want you to pick. Well, when I do pick, you don't want that, right? And then, <laughs> or if I do pick, she'll be like, she won't eat it. She'll be like, I knew this place was gonna be bad. I'm like, oh, here we go. So you speak up after, and then I feel bad <laughs> because I feel like it's a lot of pressure, right? And she's not gonna like it anyways. Yeah. Mm, yeah, and probably you probably change a uh, new different kind of food like Korean barbecue. Sounds good though. <laughs> yeah, that's so that's Korean crazy. town in Dallas. <laughs> yeah, random like that. <laughs> yeah, it's still something random, but it's always the same, and it, that's the that's the only thing. Or like I said, my kids, but other than that, we really don't. And when we do, we get over it pretty quickly, right? Because we know it's not a yeah. deal. Mm -hmm. You mentioned a lot about your kid, you know. So, what lesson do you give your kid that? can apply to an adult um so i think like because especially for my six-year-old so i take him to school every day and we do the mm -hmm. same thing every single day I say connor what are we gonna do today he goes we're gonna have a great day dad i go why he's like we're gonna make it a great day i go okay what do we do he goes hey dad we always work hard we never quit we never give up and we always help people and i repeat those those to him every single day right 
and I think it's the consistency and it's what you focus on. And so I teach them that. And, you know, we, we instill other things into them, but it's like, Connor, you've got to help people. You always got to give back, right? You can't quit. Yeah. You got to give your best. And so instilling those into him at a young age, he understands. And I really didn't think so until, you know, I say as, as he's, you know, he's six and a half now, but uh, just like, for instance, I've never had a drink around my son, he's six and a half years old, and I will not drink if he's around. And I'm not, a, I don't drink anymore. I haven't had a drink in like over a year, and I rarely have since he's been <laughs> born. But when we have events at the house, I don't drink. Other people do, but I don't. And you never realize kids pick up on things until like one day he went to grab a drink out of my cup, and one of the guys was like, no, 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 Connor. And he's like, my dad just drinks sweet tea. And I was like, how did he know that at five years old that I only drink sweet tea? He's like, he doesn't mm -hmm. drink like you guys. And I'm like, wait, what? How did he pick up on that? And so uh, it was a man probably about eight months ago. It's what's within the last year. I got my wisdom teeth taken out, right? I got all yeah. taken out. And I didn't want to take any pain meds besides like ibuprofen, Advil, whatever. And man, mm -hmm. I didn't get stitches in there and I was bleeding bad. So that night... Yeah. I was bleeding really bad and it kept waking me up because I'd start choking on my blood and I was trying to get the guys, whatever. And yeah, uh, so I'd wake up, my son was sleeping with me. And he's like, dad, you okay? I'm like, I'm good, Connor, I'm good. It's just, it'll be okay. And he's like, you know, dad, I wish you would stay home from work tomorrow so I could take care of you. But I know you're going to go to work and work hard because you take care of us. And I'm mm -hmm. like, man, like how does he, he knows, he, he understands that hard work creates this life we live, right? And that we're blessed and he he says that like he told a kid in class and he got a little bit of trouble but it, it was kind of stupid but he's like where are you going for christmas connor what are you doing for christmas he goes like well i'm going mm -hmm. to disney he goes you don't go to disney for christmas you have christmas at your house and my son was like no we do disney we do christmas at disney because we have the last five years or four years and he said no you don't and connor was like yes i do and connor was like i get to go to disney because my dad works hard um maybe your dad should work harder and you could and I was like, dude, you can't say that. But he he was able to put together that my hard work allows him to go to Disney. And so I think when you consistent with that message of, hey, man, you got to work hard. You can't quit, can't give up. But you also got to help people. Like, you know, we we go do stuff with him. Like we donate food. We donate clothes mm -hmm. to homeless. We've done food mm -hmm. drives. We do for underprivileged kids. We donate yeah. toys. So he sees people that aren't as fortunate as him. And he understands that if you work hard, you can be more fortunate, but he still wants to help people that are less fortunate, like donate his toys. We're like, hey, you got to donate these. He goes and picks them out and we donate them. And so just instilling that, man, like he's grateful for what he has. Uh, you know, he understands the value of hard work and never quitting because he'll tell you if you quit, you can't get what you want. Right. And yeah. it's just if you start them at a young age, they don't know any different. Right. So we try to instill that into them. Um, you know, our three year old, we're working on it. And then my daughter's only one, but my six year old really can comprehend it. Yeah, yeah. And you say that when when you are working and you, you build this company, how do you balance the time that for your wife, Connor, and your little young like one year yeah. old daughters? There is no such thing as work life balance. Um, mm -hmm. it, it doesn't exist. It's work life yeah. integration. And first, you gotta understand what you want to accomplish and you have to be able to articulate that to them and yeah. i have no other hobbies um i don't want to do other things like if i'm not growing the brand the rr brand or, or i'm with my family i don't want to do it and mm -hmm. and i mean my family too is people that work here as well like i don't want to yeah. do, i've not been on a vacation in over four or five years unless it's been someone with rr like i don't go it's my wife my kids or people here Every trip I do is with them. Everything I do on the weekends is with them. My workouts are with them. Everything I do is with them. And mm -hmm. I don't want hobbies outside. I don't want to go watch a game with you. I don't want to mm -hmm. go on a trip with you. I don't want to go do things with you because what's the point, right? Yeah. Uh, because I don't have enough time. So how do you, like, I'll see people work-life balance and it's a Sunday and they're watching football with their buddies. I'm like, you're complaining about work-life balance and the Sunday you had off work, you're watching football with your bros? Like mm -hmm. you're at happy hour on a Friday instead of being home with your wife and kids. Like, like, how are you going to complain about work life balance? Like, I believe it's work life integration. I tell my wife the good of the company and the brand and where we're going. I bring her into the vision about what it's going to take. But I'm also saying, hey, we're going to do these four trips a year. I might have to work seven days a week, but once a quarter, we're going to go on a trip for three to seven days. Right. So I'll work every weekend, but I'm going to take this time to go go do something with you, do something with the kids. And so 
but I bring her into this is what we're doing, but here's why. So she feels a part of it. So then she wants to do things to help me and encourage me because now she knows why. A lot of people, I guarantee you, if you work a lot yeah. of hours and your wife's frustrated with it, and you go ask her, why are you so frustrated that Joe works so much? She's going to say because he's away from his family. Okay, why do you think that? Because he doesn't enjoy being home. And if you go mm -hmm. ask Joe, why do you work so much? Because I want to provide for my family. So it's actually complete opposite answers, but yeah. because there's no communication, people assume. And so if you sat down with your wife and said, babe, I don't enjoy leaving work or leaving home to go to work. I don't enjoy leaving you and the kids behind, but it's what I have to do to provide for you. And I can't be the father, the husband, the person I'm supposed to be if I don't chase my goals and dreams. And part of me feeling fulfilled is taking care of you guys, right? And I'm going to be mm -hmm. here. And when I have time, I'm not going to go to the bar. I'm going to come home to you. I'm not going to go watch football with my buddies. I'm going to come home to you. And so when you bring her in a part of your plan, your vision, and tell her why, she feels more inclined to support you because she knows why. She goes, wow, man, like he's not going out with his friends. He's not going to work because he hates us. He's going to work mm -hmm. because he wants to provide for us. And he's mm -hmm. working towards a future, not just some job. And so I think you got to have that like work-life integration. Make them feel a part yeah. of it. And don't go home and just complain. It's like I see yeah. kids go home, man, work so tough day. Oh, like, why would she want to be a part of it? She thinks your work sucks. She thinks your job mm -hmm. sucks because all you ever do is complain. So when she doesn't want you because she loves you, she doesn't want you to go back to that job because she knows you hate it. But what if you mm -hmm. came home and told her the good? What if you came home and were energized? What if you came home and you were happy to see her? But imagine being a significant other. Your spouse mm -hmm. leaves you all day and then you get home and yeah. you do nothing but complain about the job you left yeah. them for. And then you're like, I'm tired. I had a long day at work, so I can't hang out with you or anyone else. She gets mm -hmm. nothing from you. So I think yeah. you've got to be better and you've got to integrate that. And you also got to be an A-plus player when you get home. Be A player at work, A player at home. It, it's both because you're never going to be great at work if you're not great at home. You're never going to be great mm -hmm. at home if you're not great at work, right? You've got, to, yeah. you've got to do both. And so that's just the philosophy I have. I don't look for balance. A lot of, when you're chasing greatness, you're going to be unbalanced a lot of the time. Yeah, I think so. I think so. Because um, speaking of the, you know, you have to bring the A game to the house. I I caught myself doing that. Um, yeah. Opposite way is not, is like I got so much work. I have a lot of Airbnb to take care of. And now when I'm home, I was so freaking stressful. And I was affecting my wife. And you mentioned now you have to bring A game. Now it's changed my perspective. Yep. I was like, dude, this is, yeah, something need to change. <laughs> yes, you have to, because how do yeah. you expect her to support you, right? It's yeah, like she, exactly. If you don't support her at home, then she's not going to support you in the workplace. You, you have to bring the positivity home, right? Not the mm -hmm. nagging. Now, if something major happens that's going to affect you and your family, yeah, you probably want to bring her in on it. But why would you just come home and complain about that Joe in accounting was a dick today? Like, for what? Like, yeah. you know, it's like, why, what, what does that bring to you? What value besides you're complaining? And I guess what I firmly believe... Women don't want to hear their man complain. They want them to be the protector and the provider. If you're coming home yeah. whining, if you're complaining, like, I don't know. I just don't think that's an attractive quality that someone sees in their significant other that's supposed to protect them. That, man, I my husband comes home and whines more than I do. That's probably not good. Like, I just don't want to be that. I know that I can vent to my wife, and I know I can, you know, if, I have, if I'm frustrated, I can talk to my wife, and she's supportive. But if I do it every day, then she's not going to want to support me. I do it very mm -hmm. rarely and only when it's something serious because I want yeah. her to know the good, the bad, and the ugly. But yeah. I'm coming home trying to bring positivity about my day, tell her about the future of the company, where we're at, where we're going, so she feels a part of it and knows that the hard work is paying off. Yeah. And, you know, you mentioned that you uh, go on Disney. Love Disney. And you love Disney. I, I want to know what went through your mind for the first time that you took your family to Disneyland. Yeah, so the, the first time was Disney World. Um, yeah, Disney World, yeah. So <laughs> we're big Disney World people. We, we've recently been going, we just went to land. So me and my, so, so yeah, that was last week. Me and my wife, I surprised yeah. her for our 10-year anniversary. It was I did a VIP tour at Disney with her. And then we mm -hmm. took our kids for Thanksgiving to Disneyland. So we, we've recently gone to land more. But uh, So the first time I took my son, he was a baby, and I didn't. it was my first time to Disney World, and I didn't understand it. I didn't think Disney World existed. I thought it was a made-up place because we couldn't afford it when we were younger. And yeah. it was amazing to be there, and I wanted to go back because we only went for like two days. 
and I fell in love. And I remember the first time I was there with my family, it was the greatest feeling in the world. Like, I want to do this more. The memories that we create, you know, I have like 10,000 plus photos in my phone of our kids at Disney. And it's like, I'm watching them grow up and I'm watching how much fun they have. And I'm, I'm getting to see, they watch these characters on Disney Plus and TV and then they get to go meet them. And these memories and the looks on their face. And then me and my wife had the greatest times there as well. And it's just one of the best feelings in the world. People are like, well, what about this? I'm like, Man, I don't care about the politics. And all that. I'm just going to have fun and create memories with my children. Mm-hmm. And it, to me, it's the greatest feeling in the world to go mm-hmm. there and to live in this you know, imagination place and ride all the rides. And it has something for everything. Good food, great rides, mm-hmm. great entertainment shows. The atmosphere is amazing. And it's my favorite place to go. It's literally, if I could pick anywhere. My, I sent it to my wife today, and she goes, do you think about going anywhere else but Disney? And I'm like, no. And she's like, do you want to go anywhere else but Disney? I'm like, no. And I'm like, I love to go. I have fun. It sparks my imagination. I get creative when I'm there, and I just love being there. Mm-hmm. That's awesome. And so I want to ask you a little bit uh, personal, very personal, if you don't want to say it. Let's say if you're down the line that you found your father, the real one. Yeah. What would you want to say to him? Man, so I thought about this. It's funny you said that. So somebody kind of brought this up the other day and they're like, what would you say to him? And I'm like, I don't know. Right. Uh, I don't know anymore because I hold, I held a lot of anger in my heart for a long time. Yeah. And uh, I think it kind of went away. And then when I had a son, I, I went through that. Like, how could you leave me? Like, how could you not want to experience this? Like holding my son was like, it's the greatest feeling in the world. Why didn't you want to feel this with me? And I kind of played the victim and I got angry again. And we kind of went on this mission for about a year to find him. And then I finally just said, man, who cares? Like, I'm 41 years old. If I found him, what would I even say to him? I don't know. Like, I wish him the best, right? Uh, I don't have any hate in my heart anymore for him, but I don't yeah. have really anything in my heart because I'm just trying to enjoy the moment with my kids and be the best father I can be. And me finding him as a father is not going to change my outlook on being a father. It's not going to change what I do yeah. as a father. It's not going to change who I am as a person, right? Maybe he had something going on in his life where he left, right? Maybe my mother didn't tell him that he had a kid. I don't know. I don't know the true answers to that. And Mm -hmm. for me, it's, I don't care to find out because I'm fulfilled in my life and I'm happy with the person that I'm becoming. Um, I love this journey I'm on. And to me, it's not going to change me being a father at all because i'm still going to continue to grow and work on that so i get to i get to the point where it's like if he wanted to be in my life the honest question would be i don't know what i would say to him but if he asked me to be in my life i would probably say no i -hmm. don't really want you in my life um because i don't see a need for it and someone's like man that's pretty selfish it's like yeah at this point in my life the things that i've been through i would like to call it selfishly unselfish where mm-hmm. I'm unselfish with people and I want to take the people closest to me to the top. But I'm very yeah. selfish with my time, my energy, and the people I surround myself with. And if you yeah. bring any unwanted drama or pain in my life, I'm not going to be around you. And so mm-hmm. bringing my father in my life who wasn't there for 41 years, the mm-hmm. only way it's going to end is bad. And it's yeah. been bad. So I don't want to risk it. You live your life. I'll live mine. And, you know, go on. My, my kids, they're, they're fine. And so I think that was kind of where I was at. I was like, man, and I thought about this long and hard. So that's why I said, it's crazy. You said that. And I was like, man, I really have nothing to ask him. I think before it was the typical anger, like, why did you do this to me? Yeah. And now it's like, hey, man, you probably were going through something. Uh, you were the best father you could be, uh, even though you weren't there. Yeah. I hope your life turned out great. Um, I hope you've done something because, man, being a father is the best thing. I actually hope that he had kids somewhere else and got to experience what it's like to be a father. Because I think the biggest regret he'd ever have in his life is knowing he had a son out there, being on his deathbed, and like I wasn't there because I know what being a father has done for me and it's the greatest thing in the world. And I'm so focused on that that I'm not worried about that. But I just hope that he got to experience this because it's incredible. Awesome.
And one last question I have for you that what is your love legacy that you want your children to have? I want them to be proud that I was their dad and I want them to be proud of our last name. Um, my last name didn't mean anything to me because of the father. I actually have my mother's maiden name. So it's not because she scratched out like three names on the birth certificate. So I don't even know what my real dad's name is. First name or last name, right? We've done yeah. DNA tests and that's a whole nother topic. But so I was really embarrassed of my last name because it wasn't mine, I felt like. And all it brought up was trauma, pain, and just the past. So when I first had my son, I wanted to make him proud of the last name. Like this is a start over. And so when it's all said and done, um, I want them to be proud of the last name, right? Mm -hmm. I, I want them to be proud that I was their dad. And if I can leave that mark on my kids, that'll be the greatest thing I've ever accomplished is that when it's all said and done, my kids are like, man, I'm proud and thankful that that was my dad. And they're proud of the Gutkowski last name and want to carry it on. And I, 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 that transitions over to life that I want to leave a legacy for everybody. I want to, I want to live a life that lives on past me being here. And so to try to impact as many people as possible. Awesome, Dustin, I really appreciate for your have a conversation. Really, you lead a lot of wisdom, you know, and, you know, how can people find you? So uh, I'm on Manek, obviously with Patrick Bet Davis. So I, I always put all business questions over there because I feel like I charge the least, I do 10 bucks, it's not, it's not a lot. The only reason I do it on there is because I feel like if you're really serious about your business, you'll invest in yourself, right? Yeah. Uh, and so if you want to have a business-related question, please ask it on there. Uh, Dustin Gitkowski, Manek is the best way to connect. And then look, if you're looking to connect personally, I love to connect with people personally and, and, and you know build relationships and create friendships. Dustin Gitkowski, RR, it's on Instagram, and Dustin Gitkowski on Facebook. Go find me, go follow me, I'll follow you back. Let's be creative on there. Um, and like I said, if you have business questions, not only myself, but just in general, my next is a great place to be. Yeah. Thank you for having a good, great conversation. Thank you for on hopping on the show. You're a good person. Thank you. Man. It was <laughs> the best. And I want to thank you uh, for having me on, man. It was incredible. Such a fun conversation. And just congratulations on all your success in the Airbnb, that real estate play, and then on the podcast, man. What you're doing is incredible. I appreciate it, and I wish yeah. you the best of luck on this journey. And if there's yeah. anything I can do for you, please reach out. Yeah, yeah. When I go to Dallas, I, I'll, I'll hit you up. Come we, on with it, man. We should meet it a minute. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you, man. Appreciate Have it. Have a great day. <laughs> you too.